I'm very happy to have Charles here. Uh, a graduate of 1914. Yeah, 1914. This is World War I, <laughs> World War II. He saw the invention of the airplane with the subsequent technology. Um, Charles came in rare to go when he was a graduate student here. Immediately adapted, because he'd already been somewhat adapted to all the technologies that were emerging, had emerged, and were about to emerge. In particular, the, everything that that device contains. Um, Every time I have to look at something of his through that, I get dizzy. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Charles has led the way uh, in thinking about what could be done with 3D imagery in the real world, I would say. A little, a little different than just experiencing because he's built things around it, built sculpture spatial objects and create spatial real experiences, even though they're virtual. Does that fairly describe it? It does. And he's had work in museum, magazine, and other places. He worked as an advisor with a man named Alan Chazanoff, who's a very big supporter and is one of the people who formed my interest in, helped form my interest in technology way back in the 80s. You want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now? Uh, sure, yeah. Kind of uh, as an oh, example, yeah. and also, Charles has used fairly simple technology, by the way, that's pretty readily available. And as an example that, you know, you can experiment with success. Uh, so yeah, experimentation is a good place to start. Um, thanks for the intro. Uh, and thanks to you guys for coming out. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to try to keep this fast and do some stuff live here. Um, so when I first came to SBA, I was doing very different things than I'm doing now. I was kind of working with um, like analog processes and digital processes and printmaking. And I would kind of jam them all together to make these kind of like textured abstractions like this. Why did they print the lights? It's on the wall. Um, and I was doing this for like my first couple terms, and I probably was kept going with that if it wasn't for um, um, Blender, which I found after. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my work, but I'm going to try to um, give you kind of an overlay of all these different tools that are available to you guys as artists, um, and just give you kind of a sense of how they all fit together, and uh, show you some of it from inside the software rather than just showing you the products of the software. Hopefully some of this makes sense. It's going to be moving pretty fast. It's not like a tech sort of instructional thing, more of like a conceptual, like this is how it all fits together kind of a thing. Um, so working with Blender at first, I followed a tutorial and I made a 3D model of myself. Here's that. This was sort of during the selfie like era when that was first becoming a thing. I was kind of interested in avatars. And so I, I built this thing and um, you know I put it in kind of the experimental column. I had fun with it. Uh, I made a couple of weird scenarios. I just had my virtual avatar kind of doing things that you know seemed plausible. Um, but I really got interested in the possibilities of working with CG and all this new media stuff uh, when I disco discovered, personally, not generally, uh, photogrammetry. Um, kind of like a show of hands, like who knows of photogrammetry, who's used photogrammetry? One, two, okay. Um, that is totally fine. And sort of like expected, because it's not really something that's uh, used a lot. Um, it's still kind of niche, it's used for like aerial surveys. Um, you know, there's, there's a few consumer level products that are mostly for fun out there, but you can take those free level products and do really interesting things with them. Um, I did this series using some free photogrammetry software, uh, sort of exploring like storage spaces. I like to really emphasize the missing data, which is big sort of holes in the scenes. Um, and making these, you have to kind of walk around a subject, taking photos from as many angles as possible. Um, you want it to be sharp, you have a few other conditions, um, and then you send that into a modeling program, or a photogrammetry software rather, and uh, the free ones you basically just say go, and it sends it off to the cloud, and it sends you back to the 3D model. Um, 
when I was going through those images, the source images, I sort of noticed it was like a slideshow, like kind of like a tracking shot, rotating around the thing. And when I started watching TV and movies, I was doing this so often that I just would see that everywhere. Every time there was a tracking shot in a movie or something, I would automatically kind of think like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if I can actually scan that. Uh, and I was watching Taxi Driver, and I saw this scene uh, sort of near the end, you might remember. How well you've done that movie, I don't know. But uh, I thought, based on what I was seeing in the scene, that I could break it down into stills, feed that into a photogrammetry program, and get this 3D model of that scene. Um, and I made some images with it I was happy with, but I thought a video would be better. And while I kept working with this idea, I added <coughs> more and more tracking shots. And I eventually created this piece here. Uh, it's called LAX. Um, so you can sort of see how, how that works, this sort of combination of like realistic photographic textures and then these big glaring artifacts and errors. Uh, this is from Die Hard here. Um, so this piece uh, made later, I actually showed that in this room uh, a couple of years ago, 2016. It's called Nothing to See. It's uh, derived using similar techniques, um, only those vehicles were captured using footage from YouTube and LiveLeak that had been uploaded by passersby who had encountered accidents. So car accident footage was used to create the actual like, recreated vehicles, and then I populated this space with those. And the things you see falling from the sky are the actual source material videos. Um, so those are just a couple things that I've done uh, using these techniques. And I just want to get into some photogrammetry basics right now. Uh, this is PhotoScan. This is probably like the industry standard program for photogrammetry. Uh, you can see up here, these are the photos that I took. Um, let's see if I can find those. So when you're doing photogrammetry, you really want to make sure a certain set of conditions are met. So everything has to be very sharp. Uh, it's, you don't want any blur because it'll literally think the object itself is blurry and there's no way of telling the difference. Uh, you also want kind of like soft lighting. So I shot this on an overcast day. It's definitely the best place to do it. If you're in studio conditions, you want you know big soft <coughs> lights bouncing off of everything. Um, harsh shadows are not good. Uh, here we go. So what you do is you basically walk around whatever object it is. Uh, you don't have to cover literally every single angle. You don't need hundreds of photographs. Um, you know, generally the more the merrier, you get more detail, you get more information, but there's a point of kind of diminishing returns with that. Uh, this, for example, this is just 21 shots, and it ended up producing a pretty, pretty good model. Um, and again, you can get a very similar result using free software. I'm going to show you it on this because you can sort of get inside and see what really happened throughout the whole process. So those are the photos, um, and this is like a little viewer window that shows you the first thing that happened. So, if you're going to use this program, uh, you would start by doing this. You'd add the photos, load them up, pretty self-explanatory. Then you'd align the photos. Um, what that means is basically it's going to go into each one of these photos, and it's going to try to find a bunch of patterns that it can recognize. It's going to find little bits of the image that it seems to be, that seems like it thinks it could recognize in another image. It's called identifying the points, finding the points. The next step is it's going to match those points. It's going to correlate all the patterns that it found in first image, the patterns that have found in all the other images, and so on and so on. Until you have this like vast network of connected patterns that can establish in 3D space where all of those points are. And so that's what you see down here. This is what's called a point cloud. And this is kind of like step one for photogrammetry. Um, it's like the first thing that's generated. Um, you can see it's pretty much that. It's like a cloud of these tiny little infinitesimal points. Um, you can also see that it's got a bunch of information, like out here, like this stuff, the cobblestones, the grass, which you don't really need. Um, so I put around the, the subject matter this like, bounding box, which you can hopefully see. It's like sort of like thin box here, this guy. Um, just to basically say, all right, you can focus all your attention on this small area. You don't need to worry about all the stuff in the scene. Um, then you go up to workflow, you would build a dense cloud. Um, and what that's basically doing is it's using the sparse cloud information, this kind of initial pass, and it's going to figure out like all the spaces between the points, using the points themselves. Um, and you can see in this pass, there's all this like missing stuff, like that's kind of not there, and you know these guys are kind of like half defined. Um, but let's see what the dense cloud looks like. So I've already pared away a bunch of unnecessary stuff in this thing, but it, it almost looks like a 3D model right now, like it's sort of like a solid object. 
um, with a texture on it, but it's actually not. Uh, it is just a very, very large amount of points. You can see this kind of like pattern, these like undulating moiré kind of things happening there. Um, that's just the result of that process of like kind of feeding back information in on itself. And it comes up with something that's pretty close to what you saw in these photographs. Um, let's see what that looks like as a mesh. Uh, a mesh is a term we'll get into later. But in order to get here, you just sort of build a mesh. And you can kind of get the idea of the workflow, right? I mean, it's kind of like you just go down the thing. And, and like I said, in the most photogrammetry software, it's just drag the photos in, get the model back. There's not even any of this stuff. But I want to show you kind of how it works. So um, obviously, it's not purple. Purple's just its random default color. Uh, you want to add the texture information, all that like good photographic detail about the granite colors and all of that stuff, um, which you do by building a texture. <coughs> Um, now, a texture is kind of, you know, it's not what you might think it is. It's not necessarily like rough or smooth or something like that. It's an image file, and that image file is like overlaid onto the mesh shape. So it perfectly matches the photos that it was derived from um, when you're dealing with photogrammetry. So you can see here, like, this is a pretty good representation of that rock, right? This is using, uh, like I said, 21 photographs. It uh, didn't take that long, it would probably take about 20 minutes to get this back from a photogrammetry program. And then you have this virtual 3D model of this thing that once existed in reality, right? Or still does, presumably. Um, so then it's sort of like, what do, you, what do you do with this? Once you have this, how do you use this as an artist? Um, and that's what we're going to do next. We're going to go into Blender. Uh, Blender, I mentioned earlier, uh, is one of many 3D modeling and rendering programs, like software. Uh, I think you guys have Cinema 4D here, uh, but they're all pretty much the same. Some have strengths and weaknesses, others don't. But for the most part, we're talking about the same kind of fundamental concept. Um, and what I want to emphasize to you guys as photographers is how much of this stuff you really already know. Uh, if, you've, if you're familiar with like a studio practice, if you work with lights and cameras, and then you've brought digital images into photographs, worked with adjustment layers, non-destructive editing, that kind of thing, if you've worked with Premiere and you've done some keyframing, if you've done any of this sort of digital production stuff, you are way closer to being able to use the software than you might think. And that's kind of the theme I want to get across today. Like, as photographers, you already have a lot of the tools and the ideas that you need to really make this stuff work. Um, so here we are in this sort of space here. You can see it's just a 3D space, the grid, a cube, a light, and what this is, this is a camera. So it's familiar, a light, a camera, and an object. This is literally a virtual photography studio. And this is true of every photo modeling software, 3D modeling software. Um, you have these basic ingredients, and you kind of say go when you render, and it adds the light to the object and puts it into the camera, and then you get an image. Um, this camera thing, let's go into its like camera settings here. You'll recognize a lot of this. So like focal length, f-stop. You can have the size of the uh, sensor. You can adjust the size of the output image, too. Um, you have all sorts of other things. You can control the depth of field perfectly. You can even kind of eliminate perspective altogether. Uh, you can make it a panoramic perspective, so you have a 360 vision of what's going on. Um, but essentially, this is a camera with all the same qualities that you're used to having in a camera, only everything is adjustable. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. I know I'm really mad at another view here. And now we're looking through the camera. So if I adjust this focal length, you can see on the right screen that it kind of gets like longer, right? And on the left screen, it's zooming in. Um, you know, that's basically the camera that you're used to. And it functions in essentially the same way. Um, same thing basically with lights. Uh, the lights here are basic, they're trying to replicate real lights as hard as they possibly can. Um, and they have a few of the same parameters that you'd work with in a studio. So, in this light here, you can control the color of the light. Um, you can control the energy that's in like, the output of the light and how strong the light is. You can control, um, you can see here the fall off is inverse square, which is obviously what we're all tethered to in reality. You guys learned this all in lighting class. Uh, but here in this virtual space, you aren't constrained by that. If you want to not have that, you can change it to kind of linear or a constant fall off or whatever you want. Um, you also can control the softness of the fall off using these sliders here. Um, you can make it very sharp shadows, you can sort of make it more diffuse. Um, also, there's different types of lights you can use. Um, again, I want you to just start thinking about this in terms of a studio. So this point here is like a naked bulb, uh, just nothing shining in all directions. 
Uh, sun here is like a directional light, which basically means like it doesn't matter where you put the thing in the scene, in the physical scene, it can be below the light source. It's basically just controlling the direction in which the light goes, so I'm rendering that, and you can see even though the light's below it, it's appearing to come from above it. Um, and then, you know, spotlight, obviously, kind of also familiar, see what that looks like. You know, and, and all of these different lights are just transcriptions of things that existed in the real world. That's why this thing was developed. It was developed to mimic photorealistic imagery. Um, so as photographers, again, you guys get a big leg up there. Um, and then finally, the model. This, like, this thing here, this cube. It's called a mesh, I used that term before. Um, and it's called a mesh because this is just a shape. It's, it's comprised of these three things. It has these guys here, which are called vertices. It's a plural of the word vertex, don't ask me why. Um, then we got edges that connect the vertices, these guys. And we got these planes that connect those edges. And that's it. That is all that there is to 3D shapes, only they take many, many forms. Um, but what's cool about this, instead of like a physical object, is that you can do these like dynamic transformations to it. Um, and you can, you know, do things sort of non-destructively in that same way. Uh, so I'm going to show you this real quick. I'm going to add what's called a shape key to this. Um, and a shape key is sort of like a shape that you tell another shape to turn into and then turn back, you know, according to a slider. So I just established the basis saying this is the shape that it's, you know, it's starting point. And now I'm going to create a second shape just by doing this, just sort of like scaling down all those vertices into a single point. I want to go back out, it's down, but now I can adjust that shape like this. And, and it sounds simple, but like you can like talk with stuff like this in a video game, like they move mouths in this way, you know what I'm saying? So something that seems really simple is actually like really powerful and you can do a great many things with just these simple tools. Uh, you can set up an animation very quickly by doing keyframing, so I'm setting a keyframe here at zero, uh, add another one, keyframe there, finally another keyframe back at zero. Four. And then when I play the animation, it does this sort of like open close thing. You know, really quick, simple stuff, but like the idea is that you can do things to these scans that you create that you couldn't do in real life. Um, you can turn them into people or birds or make them do whatever you want. Um, so now let's take a look at that rock that we made. Okay, so here is the rock, and uh, you can see it sort of looks like that purple mesh. You know, it's like kind of just blank. Um, you can see now the bottom here, it's completely hollow. Uh, and um, it's got all this great detail, and that's this guy on the left, the mesh. And here we have the texture I was talking about. And in the other program, you only saw it as it was overlaid onto the mesh. This is what it looks like when it's actually spat out of the program. It's a JPEG. Um, and you can see it's got all the qualities of the image, but it's got all this extra sort of bleeding stuff around it. It's kind of this weird abstraction that's just generated by the software. I actually find these images oddly compelling, but like uh, that's, you know, we're not using them that way today. Um, and I'm going to show you what it looks like kind of overlaid on the thing. So here we go with the texture. Here we go. So now we've got this rock. And uh, let's try rendering this. So you saw like how quickly it rendered before. It, it's you know it was instant practically. This time you know it's going to take a few seconds, and that's because we're we're rendering basically like a million faces, like literally a million of them, and it's calculating how the light's bouncing off that and hitting the camera a million times, and it's taking you know about probably ten or twenty seconds to do this, um, and that's fine if you're making images like. You're kind of halfway there. Like, if you want to make an image involving 3D scans or do some compositing, then what I just did in that short period of time, that's all you need to know. Uh, it's, you don't have to be an expert in 3D modeling to understand. Just let's think of it like a photography studio. Well, OK, I need a light. I need the light to be here. I'd like the light to be softer, et cetera. And then you can generate images in this way um, using any of the software available to you. Like, I, I recommend Blender because it's free. You can use it you know, at home. You can kind of play around with it. Um, and it's also kind of like a jack-of-all-trades program. Uh, you know, we do a bunch of different things, which is great. Um, so we're going to do a little more, though, than just render this really, really rich mesh. What I wanted to show you guys is something uh, a little more complicated. And this is actually like a technique that's being used in like the high levels of like game design right now. Um, you guys play video games? Anybody play video games here? Not really. I mean, it's something that's changing a lot. There's a lot of graphics kind of being uh, like brought to levels that nobody really thought in terms of photorealism. And partly it's because people are incorporating photogrammetry into what they do. Um, 
And uh, as you can see, you can get all these great natural details from photogrammetry, but if you're thinking about a game, uh, it has to render like 30, 60 times per second. So something that takes 20 seconds to render is completely useless. So what we have to do is simplify this. Um, but we don't, we don't want to lose any of the good detail that makes it look good, you know, makes it look like what it is. So we do that by um, what's called uh, surface mapping. And I'm going to explain what that is. It's basically making a bunch of these textures. You see how this texture adds color information? We're going to make more textures that add information about the actual surface of the object and put that onto a really simple version of the mesh. And so we can do that by um, kind of first making like a cast. And there's a million ways of doing this, but we're going to do it this way. Uh, first making like a cast. Like think about it like a plaster cast. Like if we wanted to take a kind of shape impression of this thing, this is a good way of doing it. We make our cube here. That's going to be, um, we're going to subtract the really complicated mesh from this simple cube. Uh, we do that with this here, uh, these modifiers. And again, all of this stuff is familiar to every single 3D modeling program. It's going to be a little different in Blender than it is in Cinema 4D. But it's the same concept. Um, this would be a Boolean modifier. It sounds scary. It just basically means true, false, or positive, negative. So it's like a way of like adding two meshes together, or subtracting one mesh for another mesh, or finding like the intersecting part between two meshes. That's all it does. What we're going to do is subtract the rich mesh from the basic mesh. So we're getting rid of this. We've already done it. Um, so I'm just going to delete that. And now we'll take a look at what happened. Because you know it takes like, I don't know, 60 seconds to figure out all the stuff that has to be on the front. So here we go. We got this cube here. Get rid of the rock. And we can see we've got this like hollow thing going on here at the bottom of the texture mode, solid. So we see how that is, Everybody, like, it's like a cast, right? It just took like, a kind of mold of this thing, and it's gonna be useful to us so we can give this thing like a bottom, so it's not like a big open shell. Um, and here's how we do that. We gotta select this like ring of vertices around the base. So we do that, we go into edit mode, and we're going to choose we're going to select these faces here. These are two faces, but they're touching all the vertices on the bottom row. So you can see I like got that nice little selection. Um, I want to deselect these external guys. And then I'm going to hit the F key to make a face, F for face. You know, Again, it's going to be different in other programs, but it's the same idea. Um, so now we've got that closed thing. I can get rid of all this like external stuff. Basically, it's like cutting away the, the plaster mold, actually. I want to not delete them. Our vertices and delete. Okay, so now oh, we also got to do this. I'm going to select the main thing. You can see there's like little loose bits around the bottom. Select inverse, delete the vertices. Um, and you guys know about selections. Uh, like the idea of a selection is kind of complicated for people who don't use Photoshop. You guys have already familiarized yourself with this idea. So all of this is kind of there and it's kind of alien. Um, but here we go. We've got this kind of edited version of the complicated mesh. Now we're going to apply another one of these uh, modifiers. And like, think of this like an adjustment layer. It's doing these things sort of um, superficially. It's not actually, uh, until we apply them, like kind of like flattening the image, it's not actually going to apply any changes to the mesh itself. It's just going to be like showing us what it sort of looks like um, from the outside. So here we go. I'm going to reduce this now to 0 .001 of its original. So that'll be going from a million to a thousand faces. <clears throat> Take a minute. So I did the other one beforehand. Apply. And we're just going to go ahead and apply because we're ready to keep it at the surface level. Here we go. We've got this really simplified mesh now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try to like bake all of the information from the really complicated mesh into this simple one. I'm going to show you kind of what this surface mapping thing kind of means. Uh, first, we've got to do a couple things. We're going to make a new little blank image here. Normals. Okay. So. What we're going to do is we're going to add all the normals from the really rich mesh to the other one. What's a normal? Um, kind of sounds like a weird word. Uh, normals are 
little lines that tell the image how to reflect light. So if you have a flat plane, um, it's just going to bounce the light you know, proportionate to the angle that it hits it. If you have a flat plane with a normal map, it's going to be distorting those uh, rays of light according to like all the little details on the normal map. But it's an image file, so it's a lot easier for the computer to figure out. You can do it much, much faster. Um, so if we're going to like show you what normals look like on this thing, like all of those faces, let's do that just real quick. It should be like, like almost like a nest of blue things, like very, very rich with blue. So you can see all that detail. Even, even like going between these modes is like a lot for the thing to figure out. All right, so these are all the normals that it has, right? Like a ton of them. Um, where we're dealing with the cube, or what we called the cube before, uh, we have something very different. It's like, you know, these guys, that's it. You know, so if we were to like shine a light on this, uh, if we were to render right now, it would look kind of like, you know, a blob. It's sort of like a shapeless blob of nothing. Um, and so we're gonna try to like fool the computer, like fake all this, all this information back into that mesh. Um, and here's how we do that. So we select the really complicated one. We select the really simple one. Uh, we load our like blank image up here. Uh, and also uh, I can show you this. So this is gonna show you how the uh, mesh here, this mesh relates to this image, like how the actual mapping works. Right, like this image here has all of the vertices and lines and everything from this mesh, like kind of correspondingly mapped to this image, and vice versa. So, like if I like select this part here, it selects that part there because that's how they're cor correlated to each other, right? And it's called a UV map, which has nothing to do with like ultraviolet light or anything. It's like this already has an x, y, and a z axis, and so we needed a new kind of axes on the two-dimensional side of things. So u and v. Um, so here we go. Select this guy, select that guy. We're gonna go into this thing called baking. Again, another word that, you know, doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, and we're gonna bake these normals. Hopefully, it will work. Oh, another good thing, actually, before I do that. So this is like the difference between them. You can see like how they're, they're, they're like overlaid on top of each other right now. The really complicated mesh is kind of protruding above and below the really simple mesh. You see that? Like what we're doing with the normal map is we're telling it what the difference is between the high res mesh and the low res mesh. And we're putting that into an image file. Um, and we do that just by kind of like setting it up like this. We hit bake. And then really shortly this should fill with a bunch of like weird purple and green lines and, and shapes and colors. And, uh, oh, we got a problem here. circular reference and texture stack. You know, this stuff happens. <laughs> Basically what's going on here is it's thinking that there's uh, something happening that's not really happening, but uh, essentially like what we're doing is trying to just transfer this information. It should all look kind of like this and then it's get, uh, getting stuck. But you can see this little section here. It's got all this weird sort of jazz on it. Oh, I know what's going on. I can fix this. Um, so here we go. Uh, you know, doing this stuff live is kind of risky because this stuff happens all the time with CG and things crash and go terribly wrong. Um, so what we're going to do is add a material. Uh, materials are, are kind of like the thing on the surface. So the mesh creates the surface, it creates the form. Materials tell light what to do when it hits it in these really basic ways. So here's like diffuse lighting. Go back to this. Hide that rock. So if we go to like diffuse lighting and I bring that all the way down, it sort of turns into like black velvet. You know what I mean? Like it says, like, the, like no light escapes that. All light gets absorbed. The specularity, uh, that's again something you guys should kind of be familiar with, like specular highlights, things like that. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're just going to add uh, that texture I mentioned. There we go. Is that. And big. Now it should work. It doesn't. I will be upset. Truth. Circular goddamn reference. <laughs> Try it one more time. I think a P 
We're getting some problems here. That's not great. Right. Bake. <laughs> Bake and check. Yeah, pretty much. All right, well, either way, the baking, you know, you sort of play around with it, you get it right. Hopefully, we get back to this later. Um, but the idea is we create um, <coughs> a kind of new version of this rock. Uh, let's see, maybe I baked it into this one. What we can do actually, yeah, we'll use this. Okay, so I got this material here for this rock. Let's see it in texture mode. All right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just add those maps here. So here's the normal map. And if we go to material mode, that's kind of what that looks like now. So what we've got, we started with this like super basic mesh, um, and now we've kind of created all that detail in this super easy to read form. So like you can really see like a kind of an effect that's like what you would be looking at if you're looking at the high res mesh, but this is actually like a very, very low res mesh with an image mapped onto it. And uh, the cool thing about it is that what you're seeing is like all of this information is derived from a 3D scan. And that's created in this sort of simple uh, textural form. Um, and now we can do something, we can do almost anything we want to it at this point. We can bring it to a game engine really easily and it will render really quickly even with all of that detail. Um, so we're gonna bring that into Unity in a sec, which is a game engine. Uh, before we do that, uh, I wanna show you guys this program here, Substance Designer. It'll give you kind of a better idea of what like these maps are like, how they work. Um, and it's good for making like photorealistic materials. So here's like a gold material that I made. And when you zoom in, you can see all these like little details, like, these sort of model little bits, these scratches, these variations in the surface. Um, you know, you can like really kind of appreciate how how little uh, there is going on to this. Where when you actually start to look at the maps. So here's like one of the maps. This is just the color. You know, simple, basic, like single color kind of map. And the normal map looks sort of like that purple thing we were looking at before. When you zoom in, you see all of this crazy, crazy detail, right? Like all of that little modeling, all of those scratches, that's all baked into this normal map. Um, and what's cool about this program, we also have this guy here, this roughness map, which is sort of like, it's telling you how rough to be on a scale of black to white. So when it's black, it's saying you are not rough at all. And when it's white, it's saying you are like completely rough. And obviously it's like a metal. So you don't really want a lot of roughness there. But you want a little patch or two here and there. Um, but they're really cool. And so that's sort of how like the surface mapping things work. It's, it's all UV map, that same way I showed you. Um, but here we go. Uh, I'm going to show you this other thing really quick before I go into Unity. Um, this is another uh, material here. So we've got this. Um, this like corrugated rusty metal thing going on. Um, it's like, you know, kind of a, you know, like something you'd see on a floor or a wall and some factory, that's the idea. It's actually one of the like early like tutorial things. But what I did here is I kind of broke it down into like really, really basic parts. Uh, so when you look up here at this like node type thing, uh, So we got this node structure up here, which looks kind of intimidating. It's really not, um, and here's why. It's all coming from these two things. Uh, these are noise generators. There's two noise generators that's making all of the things you're seeing down here. It's this like kind of black and white spotty mess here, and then there's a simple kind of like corrugated metal pattern down here. And between the two of those, we're basically feeding them via nodes into all these different adjustment layers um, we're essentially using things like levels, blur, uh, you know, like all the things you're familiar with in terms of like Photoshop editing layers, as well as the blending modes. Um, so like for example, like this pattern gets fed into a levels node to kind of sharpen it up and then it's blurred a bit to give it kind of a sloping edge. 
Um, and all of that feeds into everything else, so that one thing affects the other things, and it comes up with this kind of like holistic like network of effects. Um, you can see here, these are the maps, like here's the color map, here's the normal map, the same things before metal. We have a metallic map here too, because we got a, uh, what's called a dielectric material in the rust. Rust like doesn't reflect like metal does, right? Um, but here's the really cool thing about what you can do in something like this, where you're using like what's called a procedural workflow, procedural materials, which basically means like generated. Um, I can select this thing, which is called a histogram scan. And a histogram scan, you all know what a histogram is? Um, you know, so what you're doing is you're going from one side of the histogram to the other, and what you're going to be showing is a part of the image that corresponds to a certain range of contrast. But it's something you absolutely could do in Photoshop. But in this program, when I use it, if I bring all this, this all the way down to zero, what happens is the rust disappears. And you can do incredibly cool things with something like this, um, because you can basically create dynamic materials. Um, so you can still see, like, there's like some modeling here. You know, like, it's not all reflecting quite the same. Um, so I kept some of that noise. Uh, now I'm just going to sneak the, the dial back up. And you can start to see the rust appear again. Zoom in a little bit. A little more. Again, you can do this. What's cool about this is you can do this dynamically, like, in a game engine. So you can do this like as a player walks down a hallway or a viewer in an installation approaches an object, it can rust dynamically like this. Um, you know, you can do this for essentially anything. You can create uh, these materials using those same tools you can uh, have in Photoshop. You can actually make these tools in Photoshop. Um, you can use noise as blending and adjustment layers to do everything I'm doing here. This program just kind of like streamlined to do it. Um, okay, so let's jump over to Unity. And uh, we have here like our blob of a rock, uh, which again like doesn't really look like much. Um, so if we select that rock, then what we can do is we can add things to it, like um, all those maps that we sort of made before. Um, we got the albedo map, which is like our texture map. So let's start with that. Albedo is just a really fancy word. It's sort of actually like. I think it's derived from like climate science. It's sort of like the amount of light that reflects from the sun off the surface of the planet Earth, or something like that. But it's used in CG modeling to say like color, so whatever. Um, so we also need a normal map. We don't need like really a metallic map because it's just not metal at all. It's a zero. Um, but when we add the normal map, you can already see like it's really changed a lot. Like it's now become something that looks pretty realistic, relatively speaking. And it's again, it's a literal transcription of an object that is somewhere in Central Park right now. Um, and that's the thing I think is really cool. So now what we can do is we can actually kind of like use this object uh, and walk around it um, in this game environment. And I add a couple more maps too. Uh, I added this other map, um, Ambient Occlusion, which sounds kind of weird, but really it's just the effect that you see if you look into the corner of a room, like how it's darker than the surrounding walls. And it's because if light bounces around enough time, it's going to hit those corners a lot less. And it takes a ton of computational power to figure that out in real time. Like, you know, literally simulating the movement of photons around a room. So you give it a map that just sort of says, like, yeah, here's a crack there, and there's a crack there. Um, and you can sort of see, like, how that affected the thing. If I turn it down, it's sort of the, soft, the shadows are a little softer. I turn it up, they get a little richer. Um, and then I also went ahead and I made this roughness map from the texture. I'm just going to show you what I did there. So I brought the texture file. Um, I brought it into Photoshop. Um, I did a color range select. I, I kind of was thinking like, okay, like, what do I want to be glossy on this rock? Like, part of it's like kind of granite. Maybe part of it's like quartzier, you know, like a little more crystalline. And when the light hits it, it should shine a little more. Um, so I selected the white parts just did a color range select. Again, it's kind of quick and dirty version. Um, I saved the selection as an alpha channel. Um, and then I copied and pasted that into a new file. Um, so I pasted, just did some curves adjustments basically, um, because if it's white, it is entirely perfectly reflected. If it's black, it is entirely perfectly matched. Um, I kind of wanted something in the middle, um, and you can just keep tweaking that and playing with that until you get an effect that you like. And then ultimately I inverted it because we're talking about a roughness map. So when, when I'm talking about the rock, I want the whole thing to be extremely rough, so all white, and I want only the quartz bits to be a little less rough. Um, so back to Unity, I brought that in here, and we can add the roughness map. Right, you can't see much of a change. 
that's there. All right. So now what we're going to do is play. So when I play, we're going to enter this um, gaming environment. Whoa. I didn't know that would happen, so we're going to have some very loud footballs in my movie. So now we can look at this shape in this environment here. And it's literally rendering this like many, many times per second. And if you think about all the information that we gathered from the real world, it's really kind of cool that it's able to do that. And you can do that with anything. You can do that with people. You can do that with entire spaces. Uh, and I kind of want you guys to just start thinking about it in that term. Like, there's really nothing you can't do with this. I mean, certain objects are harder to scan than others. You don't want to do like transparent bottles or super shiny metal things. They can cause problems, but even then you can work around. Um, but really it's this sort of like dynamic approach that I think is so cool. Uh, now, just talking generally about Unity. Uh, Unity is really interesting to me because it's got this like, uh, it's if the um, 3D rendering software I was showing you before Blender, if that's like a studio, um, it's sort of like a place where you work, you know, and you create an image or an animation or a video, and you send that out into the world, and that's all people see. They just see the product, you know? This is more like an installation space. Um, so you have to think of it in that way. Like, it's, it's a place where things happen. Like, you're inviting an audience member into this place, and a bunch of events are going to occur, and they're going to be wandering around, and, you know, so you don't want it to break. You want it to work really well. You want it to work from all angles. You want to account for all the randomness that an audience or, a, you know, a viewer can bring. Um, so that's how you kind of approach this. But beyond that, it's also it's very very similar. Um, you have a camera. You have in this like first person controller here, it's basically a camera with some other stuff on it. Like there's a collider which says don't fall through the floor. Uh, there's some script in here that says walk and apparently make annoying footfall noises. Um, and there's a directional light which is like the sun that I showed you before and a terrain sort of like a basic plane. That's all that's going on here. Um, but Unity gives you a lot, just straight out of the box. Um, and the cool thing about this is once you get this, this aspect of Unity, like once you can build something like this, you could absolutely translate that into any medium you choose. Like you, you, making VR, for example, it's really more about conceptualizing the experience than, than any kind of real technical hurdle. Like once you've got game engines down, once you are like, you know, you understand them on even a surface level, you can create whatever experience you've made within VR without a lot of extra trial and error. Um, it's because it's all kind of done for you. Uh, VR works by detecting the mo motion of your head, uh, for one thing, sort of like how you're rotating. Think of the inside of your phone. Like if you, it knows when you're rotating a phone, it, it's using literally the same uh, electronic components um, in VR. And there's also something called positional tracking in VR, which is uh, monitoring your motion in physical space. So as you move around, it's tracking where you are. Um, and it's doing that with cameras usually. Um, and that's essentially all VR is. It's a screen that you can view these, these things on that changes dynamically as you move. But there's really no more to it technically than that. Um, one really cool thing that happened uh, last year is AR. Um, now AR has been around for a while, don't get me wrong. It was in this very kind of basic form of like, you know, you have a kind of image of like a QR code type thing or whatever. And when you point the camera at it, it will recognize using computer vision software what that pattern is. And from there, it'll be able to like uh, re remember a 3D model that's supposed to pop up and put it relative to that image somewhere, right? And when you looked away from the image, it would completely forget where it was, and it would have to find itself again from scratch once you found the image again. So there were things you could do with it, but it's mostly like you could look at something on a cereal box or whatever. You know what I mean? There's not a whole lot you can do. Uh, because of how easy it was to break. Um, but now we have something called uh, these, these new things for Android and AR uh, and um, Apple. Uh, they've come up with these new systems of using the smartphone. Like the things, you all have smartphones. Um, they're using all the things in there, like the camera, the processor, and those electronic components I mentioned that detect tilt and rotation to really, really accurately map your location in space. And it's going to tie back to the So you see all those little yellow dots? Those yellow dots are a point cloud. Remember that from before? It's the same thing. It's finding little patterns in space, and then it's finding where that you know, pattern is and correlating with other patterns. It's doing it very quickly. And here all it's trying to do is like, turn down the sound of music a bit. But it's, all it's trying to do here is kind of generate planes, figure out where a plane is in green space, right? Nothing that crazy. Um, and it's using that in conjunction with 
the electronic impulse. So like it's combining the information that it's getting from its sensors, the internal sensors about what it feels, how it's moving, and what it sees. And that's good because if you're moving very slowly, then it can rely mostly on the camera for how it's moving okay. in space. So now he's going to talk about it. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you guys like a demo of something I made. So anybody want to volunteer to try it out? Uh, VR thing, AR, VR thing? I need a volunteer. Somebody brave. Anybody brave? Who's brave? Randy. I'll do it. Randy. While he's in there, I'd like you to sort of generally just like narrate your experience. Um, and I'll be showing you guys like kind of the behind the scenes version. Um, like what it looks like from within uh, Unity. Okay. So put that around your neck. That's what you left. Oh yeah, you know you have it. Not on your face. Uh, can we actually get a, some lights, just like a little in the back maybe? It's going to be easier for me to see. Because this is an augmented reality VR experience. And if you can think about what that means, it's like, He's going to be seeing things in the real world, um, but also, uh, so now I'm going to pop this up. There's nothing in there now. This is just a piece of crap plastic $30 thing. Um, it's my favorite one, but it's you know still very cheap. Uh, and what I'm doing now, okay. so this should work. You let me know if everything, yeah, put the headphones on. It's going to be a little weird because you're probably going to be listening to yourself talk. Is everything working okay? Can you uh -huh. see things? Can you see? Just tell everybody what you're seeing. Uh, I'm seeing the audience. Seeing um, Chris with the camera. <laughs> I see the lights up there. I'm seeing the room, basically. What else is in the scene of you? Is there water? Well, the, oh, yeah, there's water. <laughs> <laughs> the water's up there. It's up there? <laughs> I thought it was just out of focus or blurry, but it's water, right? <laughs> Let's try resetting you real quick. It's going to be basically like what we're dealing with here is it's doing all those things I was describing. It's sort of like trying to figure out where he is in 3D space using that point cloud that you saw. Um, and it's using like this, um, the, all the internal sensors, and it's going to do what's called like inside out positional tracking. So you can do stuff that's essentially the same as a VR experience. Hopefully that'll work. The water level should be right around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, it does look like water now. Don't forget your snorkel. <laughs> That's true. Project. Huh? Oh, wait a minute. It actually flipped back. The water's back. Yeah, what happens? It'll, it'll change levels. <laughs> Are there little, um, there should be little floaty things maybe in your ear? Like little things floating under water? Um, all right, so what's, yeah, no, it, it changes levels. Um, and what you're going to see is like, eventually um, there's going to be some, some other kind of critters joining you in the scene. And I'm going to show you what it looks like here. It's going to load up. So here we go. So we've got this. Um, this is this is the scene that he's seeing in there. Um, this is the VR version, um, and that green thing at the background is a plane that's playing a texture. That is the video that the camera is capturing. Okay. So like, if you think about that, it's like there's a plane that's attached to a camera that's showing the video texture. So wherever he moves, he's looking at the same plane. But the plane is playing a video texture, so it makes it seem like he's sort of looking around the room. Um, and then you can see there's this like water level right there. Uh, here it is in the thing. You can see it's sort of refracting there. And the camera level right above the water. Um, and this is an AR project right here. Like it's got all the sort of setups here. So everything under uh, this HitQ parent thing, this is what's going to show up in the VR space. Um, Everything uh, under the camera, this is sort of what's controlling what you see up here. Uh, it's sort of really simply like just duplicating the camera, like there's nothing really more to it than that, and separating them by a small amount. Um, and then you have uh, like a few other basic features, um, 
like essentially there's going to be here's a bit of code that says generate flies after a certain period of time. Have you met any flies yet? Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's also weird because if I stand still, because I've been moving, if I stand still, the water all moves around. Yeah. No. I mean, it's, and the flies it's, come in and out of. It. Yeah, it'll be changing. It's basically designed for you to sort of keep moving around. If you if you stare at like a black wall or the ceiling, mm -hmm. it's gonna like lose track a little easier than it usually would. Mm -hmm. um, like the more that you kind of move and you you get a different information about the scene, the better it acts. Just kind of a weird dichotomy because you know you think oh remaining still is what you want, but not actually in this case. Um, so yeah, we have these certain things like I added a particle system, which is basically like a way of describing little things that move around but aren't actually meshes in the scene. And I have a couple things like little undersea particles. And then there's a bit of code here that says instantiate, which means add to the scene, a fly, uh, every so many seconds. So right now he's probably like surrounded by flies. Has it started raining yet? Not raining, but the flies are cold. All right, so, um, and it's all sort of on timers. So timers are going down and then it says, oh, after a certain amount of time passed, start making flies. And there's one fly, and then there's several more. Um, and then eventually uh, there will be rain from the sky and the flies will get washed down, um, at which point a sort of translucent glass shark will start moving around. Um, and all of that stuff is here so you can see like, here's our translucent glass shark. It isn't moving right now because we're not actually playing. Um, let's see if we can get any. Oh, there we go. You can sort of see in the middle there, right? Like how it's sort of bending the light around. So when you see it in uh, the space here, you're seeing like through a glass shark that's moving around you as it's refracting all the stuff in the background. Um, and what's really cool about this project, I mean, what I like about it uh, in general, in this sort of overview conceptual sense, is that you can do um, you can do these interventions in the real in the real world. Uh, like you can you can add things to the real world that aren't there, and you can make an audience member kind of contend with that. And I was using an analogy to an installation space before. It's very much like that. Like with this, you can really, in a very literal sense, create that sense of immersion within an installation. Um, when you're dealing with apps like this that don't necessarily need a piece of hardware like a computer to run on, then they can be you know distributed however you kind of want. Um, you can put them in a gallery setting, or you can distribute them on an app store. Um, but they can have that same depth of experience that you would have in an installation, privately in somebody's home. Um, and again, like, really it's, it's to do this, you follow the kind of basic idea that I outlined before, and then you kind of, you know, guess and check, just experiment, try things out. Um, I just really hope I can convince you at least a little bit that this is easier than you thought it was. And, I, and we did some stuff that's really hard. Like, Making an AR VR thing and doing that thing with like the taking the photogrammetry and reducing it, like it's not something that's what I would call easy. But I think you guys have the requisite understanding to make it work like much better than most people do. Um, and that's it. No, that thank you for listening. Thank you for and if uh, there are any questions, I hope you guys have some. Just let me know. Anybody have any questions? Anything about the process? Anything about tools you can use? Anything at all? Two shots. All right. If anybody would like to try this out, uh, I'll be around. Um, it doesn't have to be the VR. I'm just going to kind of show you guys the AR component, too. Um, and if anybody has any questions, I'll be here. Um, is, would you recommend going on, like, uh, London.com or any, like, website someone has or YouTube to start to play or learn? I, I, mean, I, ha I had a lot of Photoshop experience. I, jumping in cold. I hear you. Here's how I would do it. I would start with, um, if the photogrammetry stuff you really can't figure out on your own, uh, but like Blender, I would find uh, a goal. I would say like, okay, what is it that I want to do with Blender? Like, do I want to make just a, do I want to just familiarize myself with the basics? Right. Then you can sort of do Blender basics. You'll find a million tutorials. If you have something very specific you want to do, yeah. then I would run a search for that. And the good thing about Blender, because it's open source and free, there's a vast community of support. There's all sorts of tutorials. Like, if you want to do something, it's been done. Um, yeah, I have sort of an idea now, just by looking at this, and I'm thinking, how do I begin the same thought? What's the idea? I, mean, I just want to travel down a line, go around. 
It's the graphic line that I've made in Photoshop. Yeah. And it's a whole bunch of lines, and I want to be able to find the line and travel around. <coughs> so, really okay, I mean, I think what you're, what you're describing is something that would have to be a 3D model first. Like, you'd have to turn that line into a 3D model. Right. Um, and you can do that, like, without necessarily modeling it yourself. You can take it from a drawing and then just sort of manipulate it. Um, but it's not that hard to just like literally trace a line. That would be something you could figure out real quick with a blender. And once a 3D model is made, uh, then it's sort of like plugging and playing on Unity in the way that I showed you. Like you just sort of, I drag, I had all these like watery things and these extra stuff. All you need to do is just drag that one 3D model of a line, give it a material or something, so the color it wants to be like I was saying. Yeah. And that's that's it. Um, because so much of the work has already been done at like Apple and Google. Like you really don't have to figure out a lot. It's really more like making it work and doing annoying things, like when the whole baking thing, you know, I don't know what, some stupid thing, right? That'll happen all the time. That's the kind of thing that can really slow you down, it can be frustrating, but that's like the worst that it's going to be, because so much of this sort of like technical magic stuff has already been created in a laboratory somewhere, and as artists, all you need to do is sort of just take the steps to use it. Um, does anybody else have any like projects that they were thinking about doing in CG, anything like that? Anything involving anything like this? Any video? Like, Combining? Yeah, the 3D um, thing that you created to a video piece. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can do that natively inside of Blender, uh, and you can do that in After Effects or Premiere. Um, really what it is, what you're talking about is kind of rendering with like a transparency layer. Like, so you make like, you know, whatever the object is, it's like a dog or a like uh, whatever it is, you make a, the animation and you render just that dog uh, against a transparent background, so like with an alpha channel. You know what I'm saying? And uh, then you can literally import that, and two seconds later, it's done. Um, import that into, into whatever After Effects, Premiere, whatever like you're compositing in. Um, and like I said, there's native compositing tools in Blender, but it's probably gonna be better in, in something, especially if you're really good at After Effects. Like these After Effects, you know. For stuff like video compositing, like don't, you know, you don't have to stretch the 3D modeling programs or 4D or whatever. Uh, 4D and After Effects were really nicely together. And it's the same idea. Um, so if I were you and I was like wondering how to do that, I would like look up like 4D compositing and like read a workflow and just really start thinking, like I said, about like, well, all I really have to do is render an image or a video rather with an alpha channel. And that gets probably going to be like a sequence of images within alpha channels that you turn into a video. Um, and but yeah, it's fairly straightforward, and it's definitely like one of the things that everybody does. There's a lot of different solutions for that, and yeah, I really encourage you to try. Give it a shot. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Thanks, guys. You are you are free to go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>